Welcome to REST, which stands for Resiliency and Empowerment Seminar today. I am your host, Susan Gans, and I am the founder of Gans Strategic Solutions, where we operate at the intersection of human behavior and business. This show is about hearing from leaders of small and mid-sized businesses, as well as nonprofits. We hear from the leaders about their journeys, about their organizations, and very importantly today, about how they are being resilient. I am so excited to welcome today's guest, who is Terry Barrett. Thank you. A bit about, oh, you're welcome. (laughs) Sorry, I jumped the gun. Go ahead. (laughs) It's okay. We have to talk about you because people need to know about you. So Carrie is the owner and founder of Carrie Barrett Consulting, which provides individuals and groups with the resources and information they need to, to enhance their public appearance in the best way possible. The training helps you to create dynamic confidence and presentation skills that assure you nail your media exposure. And she comes to this with over 20 years of on-air experience as a news anchor, reporter, and producer on NBC, Fox News, and ABC. She is an Emmy Award-winning person who knows what it takes to be performance-ready. Why? Because she's interviewed so many people. Let's just name a few. Heads of state, such as Janet Napolitano, financial guru, Susie Orman, top celebrities such as Bradley Cooper, we have to ask about that one, Mm -hmm. as well as prepared luminaries for debates, very timely. She has proven skills that make her unflappable and unstoppable. (laughs) She believes that you are your personal brand and she wants to make sure that you are ready for your close up. And with that, officially welcome you to the show. Yay, thank you. That was a heck of an intro. I appreciate that. Yes, um, all of those things and a few more services have popped up in the last year that my business has been in business, but I'm excited to talk to you about all of it, how we got here, what we're doing, and and what this pandemic is throwing at us as well. How have you been with everything that's going on? So like many people, I am wearing many different hats during the day and (laughs) it does get challenging and there, you know, that's where self-care comes into play. And I'm sure you're feeling the same. I am absolutely feeling the same. In fact, as you were reading that intro, I was clicking my mic mute button off and on. I would hear the kids start to scream and I was like, oh gosh, okay, let me mute that. And then the dog is barking and then somebody's at the door and all of this stuff is going on. And I don't know how much of of that you heard at home, people that are listening, but I apologize. It it is very likely to continue for the duration of this podcast. (laughs) And you know what? That's okay because I think people enjoy knowing that People are being real and they're authentic and vulnerable and it's relatable. So I'm so glad you shared that because it makes it (laughs) okay. Listen, I got inspiration from Jimmy Fallon and when he was doing his show at home and the kids were climbing on him and I was like, okay, you You don't have to be perfect. No, no stars. They're just like us. (laughs) Absolutely. So let's deep dive into you. I'm so curious about your professional journey. Can you give us some insights on where you started and then how you got into journalism and then where you are today? Absolutely. I'll try and give you the abridged version because it's somewhat long because it's circuitous. And I think that's part of why I ended up where I am now. So I'll start with this. I always wanted to be an, a veterinarian. I wanted to be a large animal, specifically horse veterinarian. I was very specific about this. I had wanted to be a veterinarian since I was, you know, old enough to say doggy. And I, by the way, was also terrified of public speaking. And when I tell you that I, that was just not my thing. One of the reasons I wanted to work with animals is because I didn't particularly like talking in front of people. And when I say 
terrified. I don't mean the rational fear that many of us have when we have to speak to a group up at a podium. I mean, even just really having sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. If I had to give a report, it, I mean, I was, I was at the back of the room, definitely hyperventilating, probably in the fetal position, the, and I knew it was going to be a disaster, and it inevitably was. I think the only reason I ever got through any sort of courses like that is because my professors or my teachers took pity on me. But needless to say, I got into my, my college career two years in, a great animal science program at Clemson University. That's where I went, and I realized that as I like to say, chemistry and I were never going to be friends. It was just not going to happen. We had a terrible breakup. We still don't speak. And I had to figure out what the heck it was that I was going to do since this had been my career goal for the past you know, 20 years and now it was no longer. And so I took a year and a half off and at the end of that year and a half off, I still didn't know what I wanted to do but my school, Clemson, had launched sort of a new communications program. And it, it was very, very broad. It was speech pathology. It was marketing. It was a little bit of PR. It was some advertising. It was journalism, mostly focused on print. It was business. I mean, it was everything. And so I thought, well, surely I will be able to use something that I learn in this program to make a living with, number one. Number two, I don't have to take any more chemistry, bonus. And number three, maybe I will finally begin to get a grip on this horrible fear of public speaking that I have. And so I was jamming my, my schedule full of courses, you know, because I wanted to make up for that year and a half that I lost. And so, you know, full time was 12 hours, I was taking 24. And one of the ways that I could jam more credits into my schedule was to t do an internship. I got three credits. I could create my internship schedule around my class schedule. I wasn't sitting in a classroom and I thought, man, I should do an internship. Where should I do that? There's a local TV station. <laughs> might be kind of cool like i don't really know what's involved I'm, i know i don't like public speaking but i'm not in the classroom and let's give it a whirl so i did and from day one i i was hooked and i i mean hooked i went home and i'm like that is it i know exactly what it is i'm going to do i'm going to go into tv news i didn't know what exactly at that point and that i discovered along the journey but so i i graduated with a degree in speech and communications had a couple of internships. I went on and got my master's degree at the University of Florida in broadcast journalism. And then I got my first job in Wichita Falls, Texas, which is a tiny, teeny, little, weeny, teeny town up in North Central Texas. From there, I went to Phoenix. From Phoenix, I went to Salt Lake City. From Salt Lake City, I went to Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, I went to New York City. I was there for about four years, and then I left the news business entirely to start Carrie Barrett Consulting, which is where you see me today. Fantastic, what a <laughs> journey. And I just honor you for recognizing in yourself that Hey, this thing that I thought was going to be my, my life yeah, is not a fit for me. And not everybody has the courage to do that. So I honor that. Thank you. And you and in your story and then to pivot and discover something that becomes your new love and embracing something that involves public speaking, yeah. your number yeah. one fear <laughs> is also something to uh, admire as well. Thank you. I, you know, it's interesting. I think one of the themes, and perhaps we'll talk about this a little bit further down, but one of the themes that I think has been a, a constant throughout my life, even when I was extremely fearful, and I, it wasn't always this way, but as I grew and developed and matured, was the ability to take risk and see a bigger picture. Um, and it doesn't mean that and everybody has to have a, a big grand dream as a small dream that fits what you want is the perfect dream for you if that's what you want. But for me, 
I, I knew that I needed to take risk to get wherever I wanted to get and that I had a bigger idea of what that was going to look like than what was immediately in front of me as well. Yeah. Let's talk about taking risks, and especially I find this with women tend to be um, hesitant about taking risks, particularly when it comes to their career. So yeah. let's, let's dive into that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's scary. And I, I will say this, I think when I finally got over my fear of that, I was so pent up from years of letting my fear dictate that I was just like, listen, go big or go home, girl. You got to make this happen. And so I, I, I look back at where my fear started and I can be pretty specific with it. You know, I moved around a lot as a kid. We lived overseas. We, we lived everywhere, not military. My dad had a job that took us all over the world and all over the country. And so didn't have a strong social network. I didn't have a lot of friends because I'd live somewhere for 18 months and then I'd move on. And I'm very likely moved on to a different country. I was never going to see these people again. You know, we didn't have the internet back then, et cetera, et cetera. And so didn't have a strong social support. And I, we were living in Britain at the time and there was a girl by the name of Jen and I was in fifth grade ish and she had moved there and took an instant disliking to me for whatever reason. She was a bully, we didn't call it then that then, but that's what she was. And I, for any number of reasons, absorbed everything that she told me about myself, whether it was explicit or implicit, covert, overt, all of it. And for a very long time, and I mean decades, I let Jen sit on my shoulder and inform every single decision I made, wow. every single thought I had about myself, I didn't recognize it, but I did. Absolutely. That fear and that like rejection and that pain, I never wanted to experience it again. And so tell me, Jen, if I do this, will you find it acceptable? I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously, sure. that, but that's what it was like. And when I finally got to the point where I was ready to at least not brush her off because she still sits there occasionally. I can feel her, but I don't let her make my choices anymore. But when I was finally at that point, it was just all out. And I, I think I probably swung the pendulum a little bit too far in the opposite direction because I had no idea what that middle ground was. I had no idea how to be vulnerable and still be assertive. I had no idea how to express my emotions and feelings. And if somebody disagreed with them, not feel just devastated by it. And so I swung real far in the other direction. And it wasn't until I've, you know, I guess just as you get comfortable in your own skin and with who you are, you find that sweet spot, hopefully. And if you haven't found it yet, I hope you find it soon for anybody who's listening. It can be really difficult to get there, but it's worth the pain to figure it out. Yes. So it sounds like it, you did the work to find your stride yeah. and you found it in a very big way. So talk to us about what was it like to make that tr transition from the news world to your own business and take that leap of faith to become an entrepreneur. What was that like for you? Well, I have to tell you a couple of things. Number one, I met my husband in my first job market. And so he was the, he was military at the time. He flew for the Air Force. He, was, he flew F-16s. And so that in and of itself was really my next risk because when you're searching for a tv job you generally don't have i mean it's not like you can go to any town and there's you know this many you know i don't know i and I, i'm not trying to paint everybody with a broad brush but you know like there's this many industries and there's this many companies and so you can relatively count on this many sales positions being open or this many you know whatever like there's 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 200 markets in the entire country. There's one or two stations in each. You can't start at the top. 
that's great. You maybe want to go here, but they only have a photographer position and you're a reporter. Like there's, it's very specific. It's extremely hard to find a job and wildly competitive. So I knew when I married him that I wasn't going to have any of those options for job search because the military certainly didn't give a hoot about where I wanted to work. <laughs> right. they, they, I had to go where he was assigned. And so he was in Korea for a year and he was in Iraq for a while. And, um, and so I, I knew intellectually what that challenge was going to be. So that was the first series of risks. And then when we started to move all over the country and I was probably about ten, seven years into my career, I was in Salt Lake City at this point, really started to grow disillusioned with the TV news business. I, I love the people I work with. I have worked with one jerk, one real egomaniac that I know of anyway in my in my 20 year career and that's rare. I really, it's, it's an industry full of smart, diverse people with huge personalities that are funny and have a broad range of knowledge. It, it's really a, it incredibly, uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a, just a dynamic place to be, a newsroom. And so, that's not was never the issue the issue was tv news has always had time has always been their biggest flaw they don't have time to yes. dive into deep detail with stories and put a lot of context into things and so we would cover drive-bys or potholes and those stories are important in their communities but without any context why are we picking this drive-by versus the other 10 that happened overnight i found that so frustrating because it was it was that whole, if it bleeds, it leads. It's what you hear people complain about when it comes to the news. It's negative. And one of the reasons it's negative is because that stuff is easy to cover. So I gradually was growing more and more disillusioned. But every time I considered getting out of the business, I would get a promotion. So I, I, I went from Salt Lake City to Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a great market. I was ready to get out of the business. My contract was up in six months. We had just bought a house and then NBC called and I hemmed and hawed with my husband. Do we take this job? We just bought a house. We love it here. We thought, heck, let's do it. You know, we'll never know if we don't give it a whirl. And I'm glad that I did. But that said, that was, that was to be the last stop for me on my news journey. I was no longer enthusiastic about it. In fact, I really dreaded going into work. Um, my, the content of the types of stories that I had been covering had changed dramatically. And I was getting up at 1.30 in the morning with three <laughs> kids, <laughs> you know, um, nine, six, and three. They were even younger back then. It's a, it's a real hard. I mean, like I would Very sleep for hard. two and a half hours when I came home from work. They'd come home from school. I'd sleep for another two and a half hours after they went to bed. And then I'd be back up at work again. And I was a mess by the end of that. And so when I decided that this was time, I didn't give myself a lot of runway. But when it was time for me to go, I was networking. You know, a lot of people from TV news go into PR. That's great. I know what PR does, but I don't want to make the same mistake again. Will I like the day to day of PR? And so I was, I was networking. What does this job look like? What does that job look like? I've never done this. Tell me about that. And I met with a woman who did PR for a, a major law firm in the city, PR and communication. She said, you're crazy. You have this skill set. Video content is king. Everybody needs video. You know how to, how the media works you don't need to go back into an agency or back into a corporation. You need to start your own business and help people fix the issues that they have with presentation and video and brand storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, damn, you're right. That's what I need to do. So I went home and I told my husband I was going to start a business. And he looked at me like I had sprouted five heads overnight because I don't have any business experience. I, I was never a business reporter. I never took a business class. I actually actively avoided business because I found it boring and I didn't want anything to do with it. And when I tell you I was six months in before I knew what a P&L was, that's not a lie. Like I really don't know anything or I didn't. But what I found in that was a renewed sense of passion and purpose. I really like learning. I love learning the ins and outs of my business, especially. And I'm only a little more than a year in, so I'm still on that learning curve. But I love that. And even more than that, I really love 
helping my clients see video and video marketing and what it can do from them and take it from for them rather and take it from this sort of overwhelming and intimidating process like here's how you create effective diy marketing videos for your for your company here's how you sell with video here's how you sell when we were public speaking and allowed to roam the earth here's how you sell from the stage Here's how you create a video brand story for yourself. All of those elements, I love that. And they bring in all the parts of TV that I love, which is visual storytelling and interviewing people and creating beautiful things with video that help people and their businesses. I get to do all of that, but just, it's not about potholes or drive-bys now, it's about people's passions, which I really, really love. That's amazing. That was a sound- super long answer. I'm so sorry. I'm watching the time tick down in the corner of my monitor and I'm da-da-da-da-da. It's all good because you you've just shared so many resiliency stories and decision points that you made in ways where you didn't even know what was going to be on the other side. Yeah. And you were open to it and you were ready for it and it's working. So I'm glad that my audience had heard that. Thank you. Now I want to dive into empowerment because you've empowered your clients right, to bring out their stories. How do you empower yourself? Boy, that's a good question. I mean, there's, I guess, a few different ways. Number one is people ask me how you stay motivated. People who I used to work with in the news business, they're like, nobody knows really when you clock in. And I'm like, well, I know when I clock in. And and if I'm not on a call when I'm supposed to be, my client knows that I haven't clocked in. So there is still accountability. But when it comes to empowering myself, I I, I think this goes along with resiliency. And I a good friend of mine used this analogy when I was conducting an interview with her. And she said, you know, all our lives personally and professionally are a series of journeys. And we all have a set of tools that we start with. And some of us have a bigger and more complete knapsack full of tools than others do. But it's digging around when you start on that path. It's digging around in that knapsack and seeing what tools you have in there that will help you down that path. And then when you get to a certain point, it's like, well, maybe I need to change this knapsack out for this one and dig around and see what tools I have in here to help me on this next leg. And those tools could be anything. They could be knowledge. They could be continuing education. They could be having the right people around. They could, there's a whole number of things. But one of the things that I think is, is universal and it's hard to get there, but this tool is one that always has to be in your knapsack and that is knowing your value. And it is really, really hard to do. I find myself doing it even today when somebody says, well, what are your rates? And I'm like, "Mm, well, they're they're this much. Is that okay? I mean, holy cow, Carrie, shut up. (laughs) Sell you, you would slap one of your clients if they told you that that's how they tried to sell one of their products. And so it's a tough thing to do. And we fail. I fail at it on a daily basis, but coming back to it every day and saying, okay, I have worked through a bunch of stuff. Everybody around me has worked through a bunch of stuff and I've had some advantages handed to me and some disadvantages handed to me, but that really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's about knowing your worth and, and being confident that even if you make a mistake, It doesn't mean that your worth is devalued and you can pick yourself back up from that sucky moment and keep moving down the path. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And it applies to my clients as well. You know, when a client asks me, I need to practice, practice, practice because I want to be perfect. I'm like, that's not why you're practicing. You're never going to be perfect. It's never going to happen. It's a lesson in frustration. And if that's what you want, we might as well hang this up now because you're never going to get there. The best speaker in the world has never been there. You may think they're perfect, but I guarantee when they get off the stage, all they think of is all the mistakes they made. And so for you and for everybody else, myself included, practice is about planning. And the practice is 
when the poop hits the fan and the train derails, having the confidence and knowing your value enough that you know it may not be immediate, you may need to do a little digging and figuring it out, but you are confident enough in your skills and your worth and your value that you can bring that train back onto the rails and you can recover and you can keep going. And that's what it is at the end of the day. That's resilience and that's empowerment. Absolutely. The confidence is key. Yeah. So before we wrap up, I do have a question about what was the most memorable interview in your broadcast journalism days and why? Well, I mean, I have interviewed celebrities and you, we talked about those Bradley Cooper and Selena Gomez and um, some governors and they were contentious and interesting, many of the politicians, but I have to tell you that the most interesting interview I have ever done was when I was overseas in Iraq. I was over there for three weeks at Balad Air Base, which is a joint Army and Air Force base. My husband's squadron was actually over there at the same time. And so we did a huge series, not a political series. It was not about the war. It was really about what is life like on a base? What is life like for the families back at home and who are very often forgotten? And one of my one of my favorite interviews, I'll never forget it. We, we were in, um, because Balad had a trauma hospital, if you can call yeah. it that, but it's where all of the seriously injured, not just the American troops, but the allies and, and, the, and the terrorists as well would come in if they had stepped on an IED or whatever had happened. And then they would be airlifted to Frankfurt from there. And so there was a lot of trauma that came into this hospital and the conditions were crazy. It's a tent. It's, you know, the sand is like talcum powder. You don't realize all the obstacles that these trauma surgeons are overcoming, right? The sand, the talcum powder sand, it gets in the equipment, it gets in the x-rays, it gets in the surgical instruments. And I remember saying, my God, you've got like five people that came in here all at once. How do you, when you see American soldiers, then you see allied soldiers, and then you see like the terrorists who caused all of that injury or, or the, the enemy, I, I want to paint everybody as a terrorist, but you, you get the general picture. Like, how do you operate on that person with the same precision and the same dedication that you are able to operate on, on your allies? And his answer was, this is what I, this is what I do as a doctor. This is my oath I took, a, I took an oath that says it doesn't matter what somebody has done to get into the position they are. I could say the same thing about gang violence back at home in the United States. I could say the same thing about people who have, you know, unfortunately tried to take their own lives. I could say the same, you could paint that picture on almost any sort of violent act or injury, except one that's entirely accidental. And that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to help. And I just, it's not, he wasn't a big name. He wasn't a big flashy person, but it stuck with me forever because I can't imagine the trauma that he went home with after his time there. And the fact that he volunteered to do this and the way that he answered that, there was no question in his mind there. It, that's just how it was. And I was so taken by the way that he said it. What a perspective. I mean, yeah. I think that's a beautiful perspective to to share and a very positive message for the world. So yeah, thank he, you. he was just, I mean, the, the men and the women over there do amazing things and it's often lost and the things that the families deal with here at home are often lost as well. But till my dying day, I will remember that interview over all others. Yeah. So Carrie, besides that story, what would you like us to take away from this conversation? What would you like people to remember about it? Oh boy. Um, I think the biggest thing that I would like people to remember, as scary as it is, as long as it's not something that puts you or your family at danger, take the risk. 
And a lot of time, and a lot of times this applies to people when they're doing video. I don't want to do this. I'm afraid to do this. People are going to think I'm an idiot. And then my question is, okay, and what if they do? Well, then they'll think I'm an idiot and, and maybe they won't sign me as a client. Okay. And then what? And play that out until you come to its logical conclusion. And usually you will find that you are still standing at the end, that you have learned something through the end. And maybe that initial client didn't pick you up, but because of what you learned and you've gone through, you've picked up 10 other better clients at the end. And I'm using this as, as a sort of an analogy about clients, but it applies to everything. Absolutely. You're afraid to go to the gym, why? Because I don't know how to use the equipment and everybody will laugh at me. And then what? Well, and then I will feel like an idiot. Okay, and then what? Like, think about it that way. That's what I'd like people to take away from this is think about the risk and then walk it through to its end result. And when you walk it through to its end result, you will often find that it's entirely less intimidating than you thought it was. So yes, I agree with you. Take those risks. They always pay off. They really do. <laughs> you learn something. Even if it doesn't go as you plan, you learn something. So Absolutely. therefore you do get value out of that. Yep. 100%. So Carrie, how can we find you? Because I want people to find you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, you can always find me on my website, which is Carrie, and I'll spell it for you because it's an unusual spelling, K-E-R-R-Y Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T -T, Consulting, CarrieBarrettConsulting.com. You can email me, same address, Carrie at CarrieBarrettConsulting.com. You can call me 973-210-4952 and you can find me on all of the social media platforms. I am on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Although I'm not real active on Pinterest. <laughs> so okay. I like workout stuff and home decor. <laughs> so you can find Carrie at CarrieBarrettConsulting.com, all one word. You can email her at Carrie at CarrieBarrettConsulting.com. You can call her at 973-210-4952. And she is on all the social media platforms. Carrie, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and hear about your journey and the epitome to me of resiliency and all those pivots you'd made and an inspiration to our audience and to our audience. I want to encourage you to do what Carrie has done and that is to take professional risks. And the worst thing is you might learn something. There you so, go. <laughs> and to our audience until the next conversation.